one thing. It doesn't totally matter what color you have, but there is a slight advantage to having a colored stuff when you're doing like a deco style uh, style debate. All right, folks. My name is Ryan. I'm the director of forensics at Modesto Junior uh, Junior College, and this is the Flowing 101 lecture. So, I want to start off with this by kind of warning folks that there is different philosophies in uh, the debate community about how to best flow a debate. I will give you an example. When I first started uh, started debating, I learned a very very bad flowing practice in. Uh, in retrospect. And so when I first had this idea explained to me about how to kind of keep track of arguments in a debate round, the first thing I went and did was buy one of those giant art pads that people use to do, uh, do sketching. I remember before the night of the tournament, my first uh, couple of uh, couple tournaments, I would sit there with a ruler and I would draw these lines down. And I'd like walk in the room. And it was like those pads that would like take up like twice the size of these desks. And it was Totally silly. I thought it was like, you know, I was figuring some new groundbreaking thing out. But in reality, there's definitely better ways to, uh, to do it. So today I'm going to kind of show you a basic introduction to how filming works. I'm also, I don't want this to seem uh, seem like a bang, but I'm going to show you how to kind of add some training wheels onto the process when you're new, but also explain a little bit about how your flowing will evolve as you get better, uh, better in it. So bear with me a little bit. The first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to do a little bit of a folding exercise. So one of the things about folding a debate round is it's nice to have some columns. These columns are useful to being able to keep track of the speeches in the, uh, in the debate. However, there's also like a better way to set things up. So you'll notice what I've passed out today is some long 8.5 by 14 paper. By no means is this what you have to flow on, but I do think that this uh, style paper is better for a couple of uh, a couple of reasons. One, it tends to give you uh, a little bit more room on each sheet of uh, sheet of paper, but also I think it's useful to flow on blank paper because then you're not having to deal with lines on it. Things that I really warn folks staying away from when they're flowing debate rounds is anything that has physical holes in it because you probably figure at this point, it's not a great idea to have, you know, any holes in your argumentation, let alone like literal ones in the, uh, in the round. So the blank paper tends to work better for, uh, for that. That said, a lot of folks do flow on blank 8.5 by 11 kind of standard printer paper, and that can work. But as you'll see today, as we kind of get into this, uh, into this lab, that there is a benefit to having the extra couple inches down on the bottom, uh, bottom sheet. So when you put together your basic uh, toolkit to be able to keep track of arguments in a, uh, in a debate, it kind of opens up the question as to like why we do this and like why we engage in this. So the idea behind flowing is to give you a way to visualize the debate round, to be able to look at a discrete number of sheets of paper, have an idea of what has been said, but also what you might want to say in response to, uh, response to it. Why do you think it's important to be able to do that? What do you think? Go ahead. So you don't draw any arguments? Yeah, so for those of you that haven't heard the vernacular, yes, and this brings up the point that you don't want to drop any arguments. And this really comes down to like one of the basic principles of any style of debate. If your opponent makes an argument in the round and you fail to respond to that argument, the next opportunity that you are given to do so, usually in the next speech, typically what does that mean for your that argument? You don't respond to an argument. Go ahead. You concede to it. Yeah, it means you've conceded that point, and it really is kind of—it's not necessarily against a rule that you don't have the strongest ability to be able to refute that later in the round. So, being able to keep track of arguments in debate is really important for the practical point, but also if you want to win debate rounds, getting good at flowing is going to be really useful to uh, to do that. So, the basic things you need to be able to flow a debate round is the paper, but also a couple of different color pens. Generally, the idea of a round is to have one color that you will flow the affirmative arguments in, and a different color to flow the negatives. 
My suggestion to you all is to find colors that contrast well based on your vision, and in the case of problem mystery debate, also talk to your partner and make sure that the colors contrast well for their vision, especially if you have some a partner who might be red, green, color blind, it's probably not a good idea to flow with red and green pens because they may not be able to differentiate between the two of those. So if you start to figure out who your partner is going to be, pick pens accordingly. I will not dive too much into this, but I feel like there are cults of personalities about different types of pens and writing utensils in, uh, in debate. Uh, there is definitely a group of us who are big fans of the Pilot G2 series. I always like the point of the Southern because I feel like they write pretty quick but they dry fast enough so that you don't end up with ink all over your, uh, over your hands. Um, some folks like the really bold one-point pens. I think those are wild because they never, uh, never dry. And then for the last couple of years, some of my debaters have been obsessing and they special order the Pilot .038 pens. And like, I feel like those are like writing with a needle. They're just gonna, like slice paper, uh, paper away. Um, I can't do it anymore, which is disappointing. The sad reason that I started using G2s when I first started debating is I saw people doing pen tricks. Whenever I saw people doing pen tricks in debate rounds, it was always pilot, uh, pilot G2s. Uh, nonetheless, find a pen that writes, uh, writes well in your life and life will, be, uh, life will be good. The second piece of it is the paper. And I was mentioning having some blank online paper is really key. You don't really want to use your standard notebook paper because it's going to get you in trouble. So as you get better at flowing, you won't always have to do this, but today we're going to start by doing a little bit of folding to help create some columns on our sheets of uh, sheets of paper. Now, in parliamentary style debate, how many speeches take place in the debate round? Six. Yeah, six speeches take place in the debate round. Four constructive speeches and two rebuttal speeches. So the idea of the flow is to have some columns that can represent each of those six speeches in, uh, in the debate round. So. In Lincoln-Douglas debate, it's obviously five speeches. I've always struggled with finding a good way to fold paper to get five columns in it. It's not great. So let's have everybody do my technique today for, uh, for six. And that would be yours. You're going to have an extra column left over that you're not going to, uh, going to do. So this is my technique for folding six columns into a sheet of paper. Take a sheet of paper like so. If you have a fan go ahead and do so. And what you want to do is fold it side over so that this part and the visible part are about the same. So you're aiming to kind of fold off a third of it on the one side. So after your first fold, you're going to end up with something that looks a lot like this, where you've got a big spot and a little spot folding, uh, folding over. All right, that's fold number one. Fold number two, I like to flip it over so I've got the big side and fold it back over on itself. If you didn't quite get it right, you can kind of split the difference between the edges on, on this to make yourself like a little bit of a tri-fold uh, folder at this, uh, at this point. So after the second fold, you then should have three columns on your, uh, on your photo paper, all three columns about the same, uh, same length. Then take the whole thing, put it back in trifold form like this, and fold the whole thing in half straight down the middle, uh, middle lines. When you unfold it, you have six relatively even columns down your, uh, down your paper. You want to see that again? Right. One more time. Go ahead and do it for all the sheets of paper you grab. First fold over. Flip the back, and then once in the middle. Anyone have a guess why we orient our flows like this and not like this? More space. More argument. Yeah, more space, more argument, less sheets of paper to be able to keep track of things in a, in a round. And in reality, I kind of like the smaller columns anyways, because it forces you to write smaller, it forces you to write less, which is good, because if you find yourself trying to write an entire essay during a debate round, what's going to happen is you're not going to be successful at writing it all down, and you're going to miss the stuff that's coming after, uh, after it. So go ahead and mark up, uh, mark up at least three of your papers like that, so that you've got the columns running, uh, running down.
So LT people, my visual aids are set up for uh, for parley memes here, but it's the same basic idea with five uh, five speeches in uh, in an LD. So hypothetically, in a round, if you had a long enough sheet of paper, you could flow an entire debate on one single sheet of uh, sheet of paper. And for those of us that judge a lot, there have been times we've forgotten our floor paper and had to do this out of necessity, but it's not great and we definitely miss stuff. And so the style of debate of debate flowing that I'm going to teach you today is what I refer to as the killing multiple trees method, because you'll end up using a lot of debate. And while that is obviously not great for uh, the environmental pledge, except when I graduated from Humboldt State University, it is the more effective strategy to use when, uh, when throwing, uh, throwing debate rounds. So the basic idea on any given sheet of flow paper is to chronologically move your way through the debate, which each column representing a speech in the debate. So in parliamentary style debate, that means we have a column for the prime minister constructive speech, the leader of opposition constructive, the member of government constructive, the member of opposition constructive, the leader of opposition rebuttal, and the prime minister rebuttal. In a Lincoln Douglas style debate, we would have the, the 1NC speech, the 1NC, the 1AR, the negative rebuttal, and then the 2AR as our five columns in, uh, in that. Do you have any left handed folks in the, uh, in the room? My suggestion for you all is to do it backwards, to actually start your first speech over on this side instead of on this side, because as you'll learn here in a second, it's really handy to be able to see what you're writing next to on a flow. And if you are a left-handed individual working your way down this column, you're always going to be covering up the arguments you're trying to respond to with your hand. So if you flip it around backwards and start flowing over on the other side of paper, then you'll be able to kind of see where your arguments are, uh, arguments are at. You don't have to do it that way, but over the years I've coached a lot of left-handed people and they appreciate that both for having better visibility of where their arguments are on the flow, but also so that they don't end up with like a ton of ink on their, uh, on their hands as they do this, especially if they're using those thick, uh, thick pens. So in debate rounds, we have a bunch of different type of arguments that tend to, uh, tend to get made. But typically, when we think about arguments that happen in the debate, generally some of the terminology that we use is the idea of on-case arguments and off-case arguments. Anybody uh, heard of the difference between on-case and off-case arguments? No? All right, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. I think the easiest way to kind of deal with this when you're new is when we refer to on-case arguments, these are the arguments made in the first affirmative constructive of the debate. And so in a parliamentary style debate, this usually includes some analysis of the resolution, maybe some definitions of key terms, what type of resolution we're, uh, we're debating, a weighing mechanism for the round, and then usually a background that has some of the arguments of inherency, and then a plan text that takes, uh, takes place. And then after the solvency, we usually move into a couple of advantages as to why passing the plan is a good idea, at least in a policy resolution framework. In Lincoln-Douglas debate, it tends to be pretty similar. We usually skip a lot of the resolutional analysis because we debate the same topic all year, um, but we usually jump right into some inherency, then our plan, solvency, and our advantages after that. The good news is, for the most part, when we refer to on-case, all of that stuff that happens in the first affirmative constructive speech, you can kind of categorize that in your brain as the on-case uh, on arguments. This gets differentiated with arguments that come up new later in the debate. And so does anyone know what uh, typically the main offensive argument that negative teams will, uh, will present in a debate are? Anybody heard of this? We're all really new, right? All right. I'll give you the answer. The answer is that it's the disadvantage. The disadvantage is one of the key ways that negative teams can go about proving that there is a net detriment to passing the plan. But basically, not only is the plan not going to improve the status quo, but it will, in fact, in a specific way, make the status quo uh, make the status quo worse. So the interesting thing about those arguments is as they're presented in the debate round, when the negative team presents a disadvantage, that disadvantage, while it responds to the affirmative's case and the affirmative's plan, is not directly in response to a specific argument 
made in the Prime Minister constructed speech, but what their plan does overall as a whole. So say, for example, we're having a debate about increasing the federal minimum wage, right? And so if we were having that, uh, that debate, why might be, it be a good idea that we increase the minimum wage? Go ahead. Increase the standard of living. All right. Might increase the qual uh, standard of living, quality of life, maybe like decrease poverty. Some folks have more spending money. We could probably flesh out a pretty good case and an advantage why that might be a good, uh, good idea. Um, but if we were going to say raise the federal minimum wage to twenty dollars an hour, why might, might might that be a bad idea? Go ahead. Inflation and soaring unemployment. All right. So it might actually lead to layoffs, for uh, for example. So in that debate round, it would maybe be a good strategy for a negative team to prep out a disadvantage and say, if we were to pass plan and unilaterally across all fifty states and territories increase the federal minimum wage to twenty dollars an hour, that that would lead to a loss of jobs overall. Now, that would be a reason why things are net detrimental to passing the plan on the status quo. However, that argument, that disadvantage, which would actually contain at least four separate arguments under it, is a separate argument than anything specifically that was said during the first speech of the, uh, of the debate. And hence, we would want to put it on a separate sheet of flow paper. So behind me is a really simple debate about marijuana legalization and kind of demonstrates how you can hypothetically flow the entire debate on two sheets of paper. So giving you a little bit of a recount, looks like it's partially cut off, so I'll go with the best that I, uh, best that I can. Over here in the first column, we've got the Prime Minister constructive speech. They did some resolutional analysis. Um, looks like they defined marijuana in some terms contextually. They went into the background, provided some inherency as to like why marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, and passed a plan over here where they would legalize marijuana at the federal level, um, talked about how that would change, uh, change laws all across the country. And then they went to an advantage, and I think that it's about decreasing prison populations for uh, folks, again, half of it is cut off at this, uh, at this point. And so in that first seven minutes of that parliamentary debate round, the mm -hmm. person that was flowing this debate floated all down the single, uh, single column. Right? And they were able to get it all on one sheet of eight and a half and the by eleven paper. But as you'll notice here, they had to write pretty small and pretty tiny to get all that information in. When it then came to turn for the leader of opposition to stand up and give their presentation, the leader of opposition had a couple of options about how to engage in that debate. First, during their prep time, they had prepared a disadvantage how if we legalize marijuana, this could increase teen drug use. And so before the round even started, they had already prepped out a four-point argument as to why legalizing marijuana might be not detrimental to the status quo, but also why they were listening to the debate take place. They had some points of reputation. So if you were an audience member watching the debate, what might have happened during this round is the leader of opposition might have stood up and said, all right, folks, we're going to start off case with a disadvantage, and then we're going to go on case in order, starting with their uh, their top of case and then going down to their advantage. And what that does is it gives us an idea about what order we want to throw the arguments and the debate in. And then the leader of opposition might be like, great, let's go to our advantage. First, you can tagline our disadvantage, teen drug use. First argument here is the uniqueness. Currently in status quo, we see that the number of teens using marijuana is decreasing. But ultimately, that's going to be a problem when we get to the link of our plan, is the plan makes it easier for teens to get access to marijuana. We go down to our internal link. Now we know marijuana is a known gateway drug. And specifically, if people smoke marijuana, it will likely lead them to smoking some heroin after that, or shooting up heroin, or whatever. Um, nonetheless, this leads us to the impact, as heroin is known to kill 40,000 people per year in the United States, and that number will increase after the passing of plans. So that's their argument here why it would be a good, a good idea or a bad idea. And obviously there's some problems with argumentation, but that's why it's an example and it's at this point that has some reputation. And so at that point, they've presented their disadvantage into the debate, and if you're on the affirmative, you now have a record of that as you float it down the uh, line here so that when it's your turn to get up, you can start to point out some problems in that argumentation. But the only reason that you can do that effectively is because you have a record of what was said in the, uh, in the round. Go ahead. Um, are all case arguments always developed by the disadvantage, or developed by the negative? More often than not, but no. And so especially as you get more advanced and you get into counter plan theory, oftentimes it's not uncommon for the affirmative team to run 
procedural argumentation against specific types of counter plans that might be abusive. And so um, there's a one example of this is there's a type of counter plan that's known as a plan inclusive counter plan where it does part of the uh, plan or maybe even sometimes the bulk of the plan but not all of it and then seeks to create offense based off the part that it's avoiding. So a couple years ago I remember at, uh, at NCFA Champs, I some novices in a round, and it was like the resolution was like, we should tear down the wall, was the uh, was the res, and so we came in AF already, like, yeah, we're gonna tear down the wall, we have all this good stuff about immigration and whatnot, and the negative team came in and said, look, there's this six foot by eight foot mural on the border in like El Paso, Texas, and this mural is really important because it's about the movement of like free immigration of people's uh, ideas, and so our counter plan today is we should tear down the wall except for that mural, right? And my novices didn't, uh, what they should have done is we'll run some picks bad and like them and run some procedural argument, you know, off-case argumentation at that point. They didn't, which the ironic part is what's written on that wall, that mural, tear down. is tear down this wall, right? The whole point of the art is to be torn down. Uh, but anyways, they missed that and they lost that, uh, that out round. Um, but in that case, it might make sense for the affirmative to present a new argument during the member of government speech that that type of counter plan is an abusive type of counter plan to run in a, uh, in a debate. And at that point, they would introduce a new sheet of paper on the round because it's a new argument that hadn't yet been discussed that it was, uh, that was a bad thing. Um, all right, let me keep going here. So after the, the leader of opposition presented their disadvantage, now comes the point where you start to really use the principle of flowing to be able to keep track of arguments in the debate round. So if you're watching this debate, we know the next thing the leader of opposition did is they went to the inherency of the affirmative plan and they made the argument that state laws solve better than federal laws do for, uh, for this type of thing. And they, you can see that they made it there because they wrote it directly in response to the argument that uh, state laws aren't as effective that we should need to do something at the federal level. Then they go down to uh, they go down to the advantage here at this point. They make some uh, unique arguments, a no link argument, a turn argument, and like uh, some impact mitigation arguments. And the key thing to keep in mind here is you can see that they're writing their arguments directly in line with uh, where they are on the flow. So why don't we just always flow this way and just try to keep debate simple on two sheets of paper? Go ahead. Sometimes yeah. Debate tends to be an exposition. Exposition. I can't even say that word today. They get bigger, right? <laughs> and so what tends to happen in debate rounds is one team will stand up and be like, "All right, so we've got an argument for our uniqueness of our advantage, and our argument is this." And then the negative team will come up and be like, "All right, in response to the uniqueness, we have two responses here, right?" And now, boom, split off, and we've got two things to debate. Now, in the third speech, now the uh, the member of government has to go in response to that, and they've got to respond to both of those things. And sometimes they're like, "Well, in response to their response to our uniqueness, their first thing they said was this. We have two responses on that, and all the stuff, sudden stuff really starts." to grow out. And so having a flow that is this packed together is not ideal for a, uh, a debate round because it doesn't leave you room to be able to write out arguments and, uh, and ideas. And so this is where comes my killing multiple tree methodologies for flowing a, uh, a debate round. And so my suggestions are when you get started debating, add a sheet of paper for each major argument in the debate. And so I recommend putting your top of case stuff on a sheet of paper, and for parliamentary style debate, that's usually like your resolutional analysis, harm, significance, inherency stuff that might show up as a background point, the plan, the solvency. Though some debaters, like if they're going to start dumping a huge solvency block on you, may even want to own your own sheet of paper for solvency. When I flow, I typically do a separate sheet for solvency, but when you're new, one sheet for the top of the case is pretty good. Then for each advantage, that they introduce into the debate, add an additional sheet of paper for that advantage, and give yourself room. Throw the uniqueness argument up top, link a little bit down, internally, and spread it out, and maximize the uh, paper. That way, if the debate expands outward, you have room to be able to keep track of those arguments as you work your way through the, uh, through the debate. Additional advantage, another sheet of paper. Then when the leader of opposition comes up and they start giving their speech, for each case argument that they present, 
add a sheet of paper. And what you'll notice is when people kind of preview where they're going in their speeches, they can do things that make it easier to let you know how many sheets of paper you're going to need. So for example, it's really common for a leader of opposition to come up and do what's called a roadmap. And they might be like, all right, we're going to go on case in order, and then it's going to be three off. And what that means is that they have three off-case arguments they might want to make during their, uh, during their speech. And it might be a mix between disadvantages, topicality argument, maybe a counter plan throw, thrown in there. But that three off number gives you an idea about how many uh, sheets of paper you're going to need to add, uh, add into it. And in the case of like an abusive counter plan, the member of government might later in the debate be like, all right, it's going to you know, be our top of case, advantage one, advantage two, their disadvantage, their counter plan, and then a new sheet of paper because they're going to run some theory against the, against the counter plan. And that's ways you kind of help folks keep the debate uh, organized as you work your, way, uh, work your way through it. Questions about this? All right. Let's do a little demo here to kind of show you all how, it, uh, how it's going to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rule play being all the speakers in a very small chunk of the debate. So on one sheet of flow paper, what I want you to do is to uh, attempt to flow this little mock debate. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to be reading the advantage portion of the debate. But I have a couple tips for you before we get started on that. First, if you have different colors of pens with y'all, go ahead and do it. I feel bad. I bought a huge pack of pens from Costco for y'all and left them sitting in my car. I picked the man up this morning. So if you have different colors of pens, use a different color for the affirmative and negative in the rounds. Try to write small, right? And so anybody have Ben Hatter any? I have Ben Hatter any. All right, cool. So ironically, when I was in college, my roommate, who I ended up debating me with, was a former sheriff's deputy from Contra Costa County. And after he got stabbed or shanked like the third time working in jail, he was like, F this, I'm done with this, and went back to, back to school. Um, and I don't really get a ton of great insight from his, uh, his sort of as a law enforcement officer. The best piece of advice he ever gave me was something that they made them do for reports. If you have bad, bad handwriting, write in small, all uppercase letters. No one's checking your, uh, your punctuation on a flow. That can be a really good strategy for cleaning up and making your argument legible, not just to yourself, but also to your partner, which is really, uh, really handy in a, uh, in a debate round. So write small. Try to summarize what you hear. You're going to notice, because I'm going to kind of let you cheat a little bit and kind of see what a flow might look like as it comes up. But notice what I'm saying tends to be more than what you're seeing on the screen, because I'm giving a presentation extemporaneously based off of that information. So listen to what I'm saying. Try to listen to me and not look at the screen if you can. Um, but summarize what you say. Use abbreviations. Use symbols. Use stuff that makes sense to, uh, to you. And don't try to write everything down. The goal of the flow is to get the gist of an argument on there so that you can respond to it later in the, uh, later in the debate. Is anyone not ready to get a strike? All right. Let's get, uh, let's get to it. So for the sake of this, we're going to pretend that we're in a parliamentary style debate round. It would be very similar for the Bevin style debate round. And we've already done the top of case. And so now I have just presented my plan and the solvency. And I am going to move into my first, uh, first advantage. All right. Great. Let's go ahead and move on to our first advantage today. All right. So advantage one. You can go ahead and tagline this. Um, the air. And so our first argument right now is that of the uniqueness. When we look at how things are going in the status quo, we can actually see that air pollution is getting worse in the status quo, right? The skies are more polluted today than they, uh, they used to be. And obviously that's a, a real problem that we have to deal with. So let's go ahead and go down to my second argument, which is that link is that my plan is going to pass and now every single car has to be a hybrid car no longer have any vehicles on the, uh, the road that aren't, uh, aren't hybrids. And that's going to be really good. And so go down to my third argument here. My third argument today is the internal link. And my main point under the internal link is that when we have hybrid cars, 
that hybrid cars, in fact, decrease pollution levels, right? Because when you drive a hybrid car, this is a car that has a mix between electric and gasoline. And so since it's not going to have to burn as much fuel, it means that it's putting less crap up into the air and pollution levels actually go down when more people drive hybrid, uh, hybrid cars. This is gonna take me to my final argument here is that the impact is that pollution is really bad. Ultimately, when we have polluted air, it leads people to get sick from illnesses related to bad air. And so people have asthma, it aggravates that, but also it can give you different types of lung cancers, and that's really, uh, really bad. And ultimately, it can be a pretty dehuman dehumanizing thing, because these aren't like things that just knock people out quickly. The types of like long, prolonged deaths that come from these types of sicknesses are really horrible for both the individuals that have to endure them as well as their family members. So we see that this is a pretty great opportunity for us to pass our plan and improve the status quo. All right. At that point, the prime minister would move on to their second advantage if they had one. But we're going to fast forward now into the second round of the debates. We'll have the native team debating without a, uh, a hat in this one. And the leader of opposition came up and gave this, gave, is going to give their speech. Now, let's assume the leader of opposition is going to deal with the advantage, and then maybe they'll do top of case stuff after, uh, after that. All right, I want to thank everyone for coming out today. I, as leader of opposition, I'm going to give you a little bit of a road now. I'm going to start off with their first advantage, then I'm going to go off case to our two disadvantages, and then if I have time, we'll talk a little bit about their top of case. Is anyone not ready? All right, great. On their advantage, the first thing I want to do is go to their first argument here under uniqueness. Now, they tell you that in the status quo, air pollution is, is increasing. We say that is non-unique. In fact, according to the EPA in a report that was released in 2016, we have seen air pollution levels go down. And this has been true ever since we passed the Clean Air Act in the 1970s. And so they lack any uniqueness to their argument, which is going to be detrimental to the case because if there's no uniqueness, there's no reason for us to enact a plan. But that's not all. I want to go down to the internal link point of this. Now, they tell you under their internal links that post-plan, everyone's going to drive hybrids and pollution levels will go down. We would argue that that is not the case, and we're going to say turn here, that hybrids use these big, giant lithium-ion batteries, and batteries actually cause far more pollution than their normal combustion engine counterparts. And this is for two reasons. One, we have to mine those batteries, which means we're tearing open the earth and leaching all kinds of horrible chemicals into the environment. That stuff gets into water. But also, it doesn't end this there at the point of construction. After these batteries have been in the field for about 10 years, guess what? They die, and then they go sit in the landfill and start leaching more chemicals into the environment. And so ultimately, the plan, which sought to solve for pollution, is going to create far more pollution than it would, uh, would ever be able to reduce. And so when you look at their claim here under the, under the impacts that they're going to prevent pollution and this is going to lead to less sickness and death, ultimately we would argue here that they are causing worse pollution, more sickness and death, because they're actually going to contaminate water supplies. And when folks drink water that is polluted, it leads them to get far more sick and far more impacted by maybe breathing diluted air that's in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Great, let's go ahead and move on to our disadvantage. And then at that point, the, neg the negative would go and do the disadvantage. All right, fast forwarding again, we're back to the, uh, back to the affirmative at this point, my other half person likes to wear their hat on backwards. And so now the member of opposition is going to give up, and they would also roadmap. And one of the things that they need to do is defend their advantage. So if you can't win at least one advantage, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to win your debate. All right, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to thank for uh, my handsome opponent for putting together some good argumentation, but also thanks for, uh, for my partner for doing some good stuff. Let me go ahead and get a little bit of a roadmap. We're also going to start on the advantage, then we'll deal with their disadvantages and just carry some stuff over on top of case. Anyone not ready? All right, great, let's get to it. On the advantage, on the uniqueness. They tell you that it's not unique, that air pollution is going down in the status quo. And that might have been true in the good old days of Obama in 2016, but it's not 2016 anymore. It's 2019. If you haven't been paying attention, 
to what's been going on, there has been a revitalization of the fossil fuel industry, right? Trump said in one of the major agendas was that we were going to burn some more coal, we were going to do some more mining, we we're going to drill, baby, drill. And so we're starting to see the Trump administration rolling back these rules, which is why we argue that air pollution is getting worse in the status quo, because we are being less green than we used to, uh, used to be. And so that's a big problem with their 2016 evidence there. All right, uh, we can extend our link argument across. They don't really take issue there. But we want to go down to the internal link. Now, they say, turn, that hybrid batteries cause more pollution. Well, I've got a couple of responses to that. First, I would argue that air pollution is actually worse and a larger problem that impacts more folks than water pollution. Like, water pollution is unfortunate, but it tends to be able to be contained. And frankly, it's easier to bring water into a place than it is to, like, shut air, right? It's not like space balls where we're cracking a good can of air open to be able to breathe. Like, you can't help but breathe the uh, breathe the stuff. Like, I remember when I was a kid, we used to have days we didn't have recess because it was so polluted out. And we're headed back that, uh, that way is the problem. My other argument here is they talk about all the harms of batteries, and they tell you that these batteries are going to lie in dumps, but the thing that they forget to mention is that batteries can be recycled, that we can take those spent lithium-ion batteries, that we can make them into other things, even sometimes other batteries. Um, so you're going to see that the turn's not going to function on this argument. So we get down to the impacts here. We still think that we're solving for the status quo, that air pollution overall is going to, uh, to outweigh, and thus we are net beneficial. Great, let's go talk about the stuff and the disadvantage. And then obviously we'll move on to the other parts of the, parts of the debate. We doing okay so far? All right, so now we're moving into the member of opposition constructive speech. Now, if you haven't covered this yet, I would say that the member of opposition constructive speech is oftentimes the most strategic speech of the, uh, of the debate, because the negative team often has some ability to choose what strategies are working for them. So know that it's not uncommon, if there's not offense on a sheet of paper, if the negative isn't winning, for them to just kind of kick and go out of that. And so if the negative is running a disadvantage, that uh, affirmative came and they non-unique to their uniqueness and no links to their link and no internal links to their, uh, their internal links and took out their impact. The member of opposition might be like, you know what, I am clearly not running this sheet of paper and they might just go ahead and toss that and focus their time on where they can win. Obviously the times where that's not true is when you get things like this on a sheet of paper where there's a turn, the other team is turning your argument against you and trying to generate impacts off of your own arguments. In that case, it's a really bad idea to kick uh, your opponent's arguments because it's conceding a, uh, a reason that they might win the debate. Um, but nonetheless, let's assume that in this round, the member of opposition has decided, forget our, uh, forget our disadvantages, forget everything else, we're beating them on their, uh, on their advantage, and that's where we're going to focus our, uh, our time. Go ahead. Uh, real quick, let's take what's kicking an argument. Is that like dropping an argument? It's different. It's when you strategically choose not to advance an argument further in a debate. So imagine you're on the negative, you read two disadvantages, and you get a bunch of case arguments in the debate, but the affirmative has just been shredding through your disadvantages, but they're not really covering your on-case reputation to their okay. advantages. You might be like, I think I can beat them on their case, and since my disadvantages aren't working for me anyways, I'm going to use my entire eight minutes of my speech to decimate and turn their net benefits against them. And so that's why they might kick something. It's also really common in procedural arguments like topicality. If the affirmative is blatantly proved that they're topical, it probably doesn't make sense to spend the bulk of your speech trying to advance an argument that you're not going to be able to uh, to win. Time is your resource. Use it wisely. So this round, the member of opposition has decided it's the advantage. So they might get like, all right, folks, order. It's going to be the advantage. All right, here we go. Let's get into it. So first thing we want to point out is that they argue on the in response to my partner's uniqueness that nothing has been passed. It's all been, uh, or excuse me, that, that Trump's rolling back, uh, <laughs> they argue that Trump's administration has been rolling back rules. Uh, we want to point out that like, it's, nothing's really been passed right now in the status quo. There's been a lot of talk about stuff, but I think one of the like, saving graces that we have is that our government is so polarized and dysfunctional right now that it's been pretty difficult for Trump to get his agenda through. And so their whole, uh, their whole argument here about uh, things getting worse, this hasn't happened yet. We've been able to block a lot of these things. And like, why obviously there's been some problems, uh, we would still point that air pollution hasn't dramatically gotten worse in the last, uh, in the last few, uh, few years and that the Clean Air Act is still a law and we still have to abide by, uh, by this. 
and things haven't, uh, haven't changed yet. All right, let's go down to the internal link argument. I think they kind of mishandle my partner's argumentation here, and so I want to bring up a couple of points. So on the internal link, they tell you that uh, air pollution is worse and that batteries can be recycled. So first off, they don't really interact with our point that mining contaminates the groundwater. It literally cracks open the earth, and like that water that is supposed to be safe to be able to be accessed and mined, ultimately can have heavy metals leached into this, and this can cause real, uh, real harm. They try to get out of our internal link arguments here by being like, it's cool, we can recycle the batteries. Well, guess what? Even the process of recycling creates contamination. They use a lot of water in the recycling process of trying to get the worst stuff out of whatever's being recycled, and oftentimes that materials, the acids, the hard heavy metals and whatnot, is even expedited at least quicker into the water supply when it happens. So don't let them convince you that there's no problem with their batteries. It's bad because of mining, which they don't really address, but also recycling is a bad problem as, uh, as well. And so they try to tell you the impact level that air pollution outweighs. We don't think so, right? Like they mentioned, like they used to have bad days for uh, for recess where they couldn't go play. Guess what? You have a day where there's no recess. You stay inside away from the smog. Guess what? You can't avoid not being able to drink water. And so at the end of the day, we think that water pollution, which is something their plant significantly makes worse, is something that should be valued in this uh, in this breakout, and is the reason to reject the uh, the affirmative because they significantly make worse. All right, this wraps up the number of opposition constructive speech, and now the handoff happens to the leader of opposition. There's different theories about the best way to handle rebuttals. I think what typically makes a lot of sense in the leader of opposition rebuttal is if your partner just did a good job, like most of the work on the flow should be taken care of, and so it's not uncommon for a leader of opposition to basically say like, all right, so for uh, we're going to start here with a little bit of a roadmap. We're going to give you an overview why we're winning. And then I'm just going to kind of walk you through the flow and prove that that's the case. Part of this is also important because the leader of opposition can't make new arguments that their partner didn't extend and make during their, uh, their presentation. So that usually tends to be a better strategy than going back down the flow and trying to bring up a bunch of new, uh, new stuff. Obviously, in LD, these two speeches are one speech. So that all of it. So the leader of opposition might be like, all right, folks, let's go ahead and get to it. I think it's going to be an easy bout for the negative today, and it's all going to happen on the advantage sheet. So let's go ahead and go to it. So the main voting issue in this, uh, in this round is that the, at the end of the day, the affirmative team is making the status quo worse. I think that you're going to be voting for the negative because of the turn that we made during the leader of constructive speech is that when you use hybrid cars, you're going to significantly increase the number of these batteries. And these batteries are bad because of the mining process, but also, as they pointed out, like the recycling process is bad as well. This is going to contaminate and poison the water supplies. And so at the end of the day, the status quo will be significantly net detrimentally worse as a result of uh, and probably after this point, they would go and do a little bit of like what we call some impact comparison and calculus, especially if there were other disadvantages and things still uh, still alive. But it's not uncommon to not have too much, but maybe you would have the leader of opposition kind of extend and pull these arguments, uh, arguments across. All right. This then sets up the final speech of the debate. The prime minister is going to come back here and pull off some PMC magic and try to prove to, uh, to us why the affirmative team might still have some net benefits. Now, if the negative has kicked everything except for this advantage, really what that means is that the affirmative, they can win this sheet of paper, they've won the, uh, won the debate. So prime minister might get up, and one of the things about the prime minister constructive speech is they do have the ability to kind of respond to some of the new stuff that came out of the member of opposition constructive speech because it's their first chance to get to respond to it. But they also need to kind of present their case to you why they're not beneficial in the uh, in the So Prime Minister, I'm like, all right, folks, well, thanks for coming out. It's been an exciting debate today. Um, I think we can prove to you that at the end of the day, you're going to be voting for the affirmative. So we're just going to be kind of carrying some stuff across on our top of case, and then it's going to be the advantage. All right, you need to pull across everything on the top of the case. It hasn't been disputed in this, uh, in this round. If we can prove to you that our that we have access to our impacts of our advantage at the end of the round through the lens of net benefits, you're going to be voting for the affirmative team. So let's go down the floor and talk about a couple of things. So first off, on the uniqueness, 
They try to tell you that nothing is fast, that it's all been, uh, been taught. And we think that like, that's not really a fair, fair evaluation of what the Trump administration has been, uh, has been done. And they're right, there haven't like, been major pieces of legislation um, passed, but like, stuff has been proposed and like, looks like it could pass. But even beyond that, like, we said Trump is rolling back rules, and he is. Trump has executive power over organizations like the EPA. And when we look at uh, look what's been going on, that's why we're seeing the problem with air pollution increasing. Like it's through the power that the executive has that these harms are uh, harms are happening. So don't buy their argument that we don't have any weakness. We do. Things are getting worse. They are not headed in the right direction anymore. Hence the reason that we need to enact our uh, our plan. So let's go down now to the uh, internal link again. Our links before pass the whole time here. Um, so. I think the key point that you need to walk away from is that they may have some points about water contamination and mining, but my partner makes good points about how this stuff can be contained. Breathing is not optional. If you poison the air and destroy the planet, this is going to be a far larger impact. It's going to impact far more people than where these uh, mining contaminations will take place. So when we look at the round through the lens of net benefits, we can see that passing the plan, because we gain access to our solvency for air pollution, is going to benefit more people than it might have the potential to hurt. So at the end of the day, the status quo will be improved compared to how it is right now if we continue to let air pollution get worse and we continue to allow people to get sick and die. So for these reasons, we're going to vote for the affirmative. How do we do on the flow, folks? All right. Is this making sense, what we're looking to do here? Now, in a standard debate, know that you're going to have probably somewhere between three and five sheets of paper that look like this. And you're going to spend some time not just on the advantage, but on the disadvantage, on the top of the case. If your opponents are getting you savvy and running a topicality argument against you, you might have a sheet of paper for the, uh, for the topicality. But ultimately, like, I think the big takeaway from this, uh, this today is that the more you have the ability to practice flowing, the easier it gets in the long run. So, a couple things to make sure that you're doing as you start to develop your skills as a, uh, as a flower. First, make sure that you understand the structure and the mechanics of the flow, and like what you put and, where you, and how you write things in response to that. That part's making sense, then you're ready to start to understand like how a flow works and why it works and how it's useful to you in a, uh, in a debate round. One of the best advices that I can give novices is to work the line by line on the flow. When you're new at debate, you haven't had a chance to kind of learn some of the ins and outs, specific types of, uh, types of arguments, like it is really useful to just start at the top and be like, all right, let's look at their disadvantage. First argument they made here was the uniqueness. Okay, they said this, our response to this, that is this. All right, go down to the link. They said this, our response is that. And if you do that all the way down, what that does is it basically builds a wall of ink down your flow, and now your opponent has to respond to all of those things. And if they don't, you should call them on it during the next speech, because they dropped one of your arguments. And if you think about especially arguments like advantages and disadvantages, that kind of function as chains of, uh, of logic in a debate, if you can break one of the pieces of that, uh, that chain, it can actually take away that whole argument for them to round. And so if you're in a debate round, and you're on the affirmative, you're debating someone, and they have a disadvantage, and you have a really solid reason why their internal link argument doesn't lead to their impact, and you make that no link argument, and they don't respond to it, or they don't respond to it well, that knocks out the entire thing. It's not like they won three-fourths of the disadvantage. Like, that can take out the entire advantage. They don't have access to their impacts. They don't prove net detriment. And that argument disappears in the debate. But you've got to call them on it. You've got to call them out. If they drop your arguments, you've got to call them if they're not effectively responding to your arguments. Go ahead. So if, if they don't respond to an argument in the next segment, they can never respond to it again? Well, so during constructive speeches, it's true, right? Because if they don't, technically there's not a hard and fast rule, but they can't respond to it in as long as they still have constructive speech left. So if you're the affirmative and the leader of opposition ignores your advantage, what I would do in the next case is be like, all right, let's go to our advantage. 
They hold concede our advantage. We have full access to our attacks. You blow up on that stuff when it's such a big deal on the debate. Now, if member of opposition comes up and starts responding to your advantage, there's no rule against it. You can't call a point of order like you could if it was a leader of opposition, but it's abusive is all, uh, all hell. And you can point that argument out to your judge. Like, look, they presented a bunch of new things here, but also it's kind of a strategic mistake on their part because now the prime minister gets to get up and be like, all right, they made a bunch of responses on the argument. Guess what I get to do now? I get to make a bunch of new arguments in my rebuttal, and you know what they don't have after my rebuttal? Anything else, and so that's really dangerous. It's also why like, you never really want to present stuff brand new after the initial speeches. Like if you are in a debate round um, and on the negative and don't get to your second disadvantage, it is really risky to bring a new disadvantage up during the member of opposition constructive speech, because you can talk about it, your partner can talk about it, and also the prime minister has to be like, all right, turn, we saw for that. And so like obviously that's not uh, not great. So that's kind of kind of how that works. Now, if they are making new arguments during the rebuttals though, like especially in Parley, you want to hit your timer, call a point of order, because making new arguments in the rebuttals is like one of the three basic uh, rules that we do have in the uh, event along with like time limits and uh, and whatnot. So it's useful to stop the uh, stop the round point out that they uh, they can't do that, present your point of order to the judge and they can rule on it. In Lincoln Douglas, like you just kind of have to trust your judges to protect the flows. But if people are making new arguments during a rebuttal, especially a negative rebuttal, yeah, you know, call them on that stuff in the uh, in the final speech and use that uh, use that against them. As you get better you'll learn the tricks of the language of reputation. You heard me say things like non-unique and no link and whatnot. Those are good things to understand. If you do those, you can really work your way, uh, work your way down. Um, and remember, if they don't respond to your argument, you can see to your argument. Last thing I'll add as we wrap up here today is you can practice being better at flowing. You can do it in between tournaments. And so some great drills that are useful is like watch the news, flow the news. And I'll tell you about what's going on, which is going to be helpful at debate tournaments. Uh, but also it's a good practice to Take flow paper, go down and start summarizing arguments and getting better at it, better at it. Um, you can flow past songs is a really good uh, is a really good technique. How many folks in here have heard of the band REM? Every year it gets less and uh, <laughs> less and less. Well, if you've never heard the song, you should definitely listen to REM. It's the end of the world as you know it. There is like a mythos in debate that that song was written after the lead, uh, lead singer went to a policy debate tournament and heard a bunch of people talking a million miles a minute and uh, um, talking about nuclear war and you know blah 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 and, and whatnot and that's where that song came from. They did, Arnie and the band did donate a bunch of money to a kind of speech comm department so like it seems like there might be some truth in the, uh, in the legend. Uh, nonetheless, flowing songs you listen to them can be a good strategy to get better at playing fast debates. And then flow debates. Like one of the best ways, other than getting actually having debates and doing debate, getting good at debate, is watching debate. There is a website, uh, debatevid.io, which is a huge repository of rounds from tournaments. Like some of the best things that you can learn as a debater. This is a cool thing that you all have that we really didn't have when I was debating. Go watch some of the best people in the country and watch what their techniques are. Watch what their strategies are. Watch how they do debate, uh, debate rounds and then use those things. Like we're a community that borrows from each other quite, uh, quite a bit. So search for NPDA debates or sample NPDA debates. Search for NFALD debates. If you go on to our YouTube channel, not only do we have like a lot of lectures and stuff like this on the NCFA website, we also have a ton of sample debates that uh, happen. So, what are you guys going to do at lunch today? Pizza. 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 We should flow the debate that's happening at lunch because it's going to be a great opportunity to practice doing it for um, before you actually have to. Any other questions that I can add? Why do paper priorities? Ah, that's a good one. So, in Lincoln Douglas debate, if you're not debating paperlessly, which you should just debate paperlessly, you're going to end up with a packet of uh, papers that you're reading in the round. What color paper do you think they're going to typically print on in those packets? White paper, right? And it gets really confusing when you're trying to figure out where your flows are and you have 80 different sheets of paper all over your desk. So it's nice to always be able to find your flow. And so if you're debating on paper, and Lincoln Douglas debate, first, learn how to debate paperless, it's way better in the, in the long run. But if you're debating paper, it's handy to have, uh, have that. And so if folks are using paper, some of the packets today, 
feel free to steal some of my blue paper uh, for that. If anyone else needs some long stuff, feel free to take as much as